1580 final take. We're back. Worldwide Fred, Lisa Lisa, Chris Brewer, and on the line with us is uh, Carl Romain, uh, uh, a specialist in the field that we were just talking about before we went to break. Carl, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, nice no, to have you just, on, we, Carl. We, we, yeah, we're so glad to have you back. And uh, you know, now that the Richie Incognito and the uh, Jonathan Martin thing is coming to, as far as the the Wells investigation, the NFL investigation has come to a head. And the last time we had you on the air, I really felt like we didn't have you on long enough okay. to allow you to try to help heal what's going on, what has happened. Uh, right before the the break, Fred was very adamant that some another NFL team will actually sign Richie Incognito before they sign Jonathan Martin because he's a good player. And my point to that is they may, but Jonathan Martin, from and like I said, I don't play a psychologist, but I do play one on the radio or a psychoanalyst <laughs> or anything else. But I do see a, a, a pattern of bipolar, you know, some type of bipolar anxiety or of, uh, of something's going on with Jonathan Martin, with uh, Richie Incognito that he needs to get help, not just for the NFL, but for his for the rest of his life, for the way he's going to live his life. Because right. this is like the fourth time he's been in a situation like this, and the world doesn't operate in that in in his bubble. Well, well it's really I, just, it's, I think it's really important for him to to work on his self esteem and self confidence. Uh, I know something I read had said something about him being bullied before previously in his life. So this is an ongoing situation, like you said, and it's something that definitely needs some help in dealing with his self, sense of self-confidence with, uh, so that it doesn't reoccur, you know, because it will show up again. Well, it's already now, shown up. Uh, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, you know, that you talk about these enablers, um, people around him, you know, it's reading the the commentary to to have you on, Carl. Yeah. And, you know, they were saying even now after a, a very damning NFL Commission report, which was released on Friday, um, it, there, you know, a, a pattern of abusive, unprofessional behavior of Martin and others um, by select Dolphin players. Now, even with a clear pile of evidence that was neatly presented, there will always be enablers who believe that a football player like um, Incognito, I meant to say Incognito, not Martin, is is to blame for letting a situation, well, and Martin, letting a situation get bad like this, and that football lives by different rules and that bullies can be bullied back and that as a football player, Martin should have known this. So these enablers want to feed a fantasy. Do you think, Carl, that that Jonathan Martin should have known about all this potential, you know, um, craziness that goes on in the NFL, for, for lack of a better verb? Um, because, you know, they perpetuate the image that football is a fortress of toughness and impenetrable... And uh, immune, um, kind of old school code, old school guarding, but um, and 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 that it's it's uh, kind of indecipherable to outsiders, you know, like say, well, not you and me, but you know, to people who don't really have a clue of what's going on, is Martin just as culpable here as Richie Incognito and the rest of the uh, the brass in Miami? Uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. You bring up a lot of really good points there. I think that, you know, the sports environment, the locker room environment, and every team has a different culture. Every team is going to have different things that go on in the locker room. But there is, uh, there, there is a different dynamic that goes on. There is some of the tough guy stuff that happens. There is a lot of joking. There's a lot of playing that does happen. Uh, usually it's a lot more respectful, respectful than, than what happened with the uh, Jonathan Martin incognito case. I think that is an extreme example of something going awry. And I think that, you know, you have 
two players both acting out, both acting in a way that is is not representative of of what the team culture should be. And I think that you know the other players need to get involved in and in kind of uh, you know tone it down. You know when they see it getting out of control. Um, and management, you know, is also we got to look at management because management has to know what's going on with their team and their players, and, and they, you know, the coaches ultimately have to set the tone and, and what's going to happen and what's acceptable and what's not. Well, the general manager is uh, he's culpable because they already fired him, mm-hmm. and now uh, they got a new GM, so there it's just going down the ladder now. I say we just hit the tip of the iceberg on this because people were saying that Jonathan Martin was doing his fair share of bullying too, other players, and his uh, assistant uh, trainer. Mm-hmm. So, and the only right. why and, he and decided to go happens. the way. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Well, no, I was sometimes just saying, it does you know, happen with you. <laughs> sometimes it does happen where you know you have somebody who's being bullied and they act out by being bullies to somebody else. Right, and they said the only reason why he said anything is only when his play started to deteriorate in the first part of the year. Because when the season first started, he was very, very good, and then all of a sudden something happened and he started playing poorly. Then it was, oh, oh woe is me, and then the rest is history. Right. I, I think we still don't know everything that's going on with Martin. I'd li- again, I've, I've said this before. But I'd like to hear more from him. I'd like to hear more from his, from him directly. You know, talking about his experience and what was really happening with him. You know, knowing that he has a history of being bullied, I'm sure that you know a lot of his acting out is because of that, and him maybe trying to be one of the guys, trying to hang out with this culture of the locker room, and then suddenly realizing maybe that he couldn't do it, that he didn't have it in him. You know. So uh, I would still like to hear more from him and hear his side of it. He, he really hasn't spoken out. They interviewed him right before the Super Bowl. Actually, Tony Dungy did. Mm-hmm. And uh, it didn't really bring a lot of insight to what was going on. But the one thing that's real clear, there's one thing that's so clear in this, and Lisa mentioned the code of the locker room. And uh, being a former NFL player and just and, and being active in uh, organized forces, I was like, seven years old there has to be and i think we talked about earlier there has to be someone in that locker room that makes you feel safe that knows that there's a line that you can't cross there's got to be a leader in that locker room that said or the head coach or an assistant coach someone is someone who's in control who can say or some type of captain who can say okay guys we've gone too far and then everybody backs off and they laugh about it and they keep going they never had that. That, right. in my opinion, I wasn't in that locker room, but from what I've heard, that didn't take place. The uh, the, the situations of of harassment continue even beyond what should have been. There should have been somebody there that says, you know, there's there's got to be a safe button that says, okay, we can't, we we can't, you, okay, We've gone you, too you far. went too far yeah. on that one. Yeah. yeah, you've gone too far. And obviously, now that they're firing coaches and head trainers. Uh, you know, Richie and uh, Jonathan Martin didn't feel that safety net anywhere. And then so what Lisa said, then you go through the five steps, and one of those steps was punch the guy in the nose who's bothering you. I don't think that's an acceptable step. Even no, in, I mean, on the football field, we could we could fight it out, but that's not an acceptable step because that just leads to another step. That leads right. to another violent step. And then now... Richie in uh, Jonathan Martin punches Richie. Now Richie punches back, and then Jonathan doesn't like that solution. And then so what, he gets a he gets his helmet, a baseball bat, a gun. Then what? You know we've got more of a mess. Right. That just es- violence just escalates violence. Right. Agreed. I, I, and I think you know, you bring up again a lot of great points there. I think what we have to recognize, too, is that our society is changing altogether and things aren't the way they always used to be. And so I think football or any sport has to adapt and change to the times accordingly. And we have to watch how we treat people and recognize that certain people will be more sensitive about certain topics because we don't know their history. We don't know their background. We just know 
that this person is a great athlete and he managed to make it to this level. And we, you know, again, looking at Martin and knowing that his, in his background there was this, this uh, experience of being bullied, we know that at some point his self-esteem was probably damaged from it, and then that just persisted with what was going on in the locker room. And we have to be mindful of those things. And at the end of the day, I think I've said this before, too, where, you know, when you come to professional sports, you've paid a lot of money to be a team and to win, Right. So it's really right. about paying attention to that and being mindful of, you know, if I'm damaging my teammate, I'm hurting my chances of winning. Carl, let me ask you a question. You know, as a former NFL trainer, did you ever observe bullying of any kind? Because you were about as up close and personal as it gets. You know, I worked with the New York Giants uh, back in the year 2000. And I did not witness anything like that. I actually witnessed the spirit of cooperation. Um, you know, we're talking about, you know, Amani Tumor, Howard Cross, Michael Strahan, uh, you know, that, that group of guys. I mean, they're, they're right, good very people. classy guys, first of all. So um, you really didn't see that kind of stuff going on. And the team leaders really um, took a stand for the team and really talked about, you know, how we're going to come together and win. I don't know if you remember... Carl, 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 we're up against it. We're going to come back and uh, stick around because we want to let you finish answering that question, Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And I know Chris and Fred have others and want to talk about what the lessons can Mm -hmm. our children learn from this. ESPN ESPN 1580. 1580. There we go. Living Stereo. Final take. We are with our guests, Carl Romain. Uh, it's the Brew Crew, Lisa Lisa, the Worldwide Fred, Chris Brewer, and Carl uh, is a. Um, I don't know. I guess he, I, what the best way to describe him, describe him as we learned off the air, is a master instructor, a seafood, which means master instructor. And I probably he probably wouldn't describe himself that way, but uh, he's just a guy who sounds like to me who just wants to make the world a better place. And if you go on his website, S-I-F-U Seafood, R-O-M-A-I-N.com, you'll get an opportunity to learn more about him. And we're just honored to have him on. He's been with, uh, he's been on Oprah, he's been on Dr. Oz, and as we said before, now he's on Final Take. His life is complete. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> there you go. Carl, we're right in the middle of this, and it, uh, we've got. That's why we. Last time we had you on, it was. Uh, I think it was just too short of a time period, because yeah. even over the break, we're <laughs> even during the break, we're still talking about this issue, <laughs> and and I and, and I and I pray, I really do, that this is not just glossed over, because see, there's some other issues coming down the pipe that we need to make sure that we are in in the place to to handle it mm-hmm. you know uh and 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 when you 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 talk about the uh, richie incognito and that's the main story we're talking about at this moment you're probably talking about a guy who you know regardless of his prowess on the football field his girth and and you know to some extent his success has real esteem issues Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think those uh, self-esteem issues are what's really coming out. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, whether somebody's a world-class athlete or not, we have to look at that person as a person. You know, I recently uh, started working with Maurice Evans, and one of the things that we want to do with advanced wealth professionals is really try to help other athletes and, and look at their life in a broader sense. You know, so many times we're kind of focused on learning our skills, learning the plays, or developing ourselves as athletes in all the different areas that we have to do. And to reach an elite level, you have to be really dedicated and put a lot of time into it. That means that there are other areas in your life that you're leaving behind, and you might not be maturing or growing at the same rate in those areas. So we put these athletes on a pedestal, and we forget that they're people at the end of the day. And those people have issues. They have problems. They have challenges and things that they need to overcome. 
And so we need to uh, work with those athletes and make sure that they get the guidance in the other areas of their life, not just their career, but their relationships, their spiritual life, their the money management. I mean, I think Maurice said there's 65% of all uh, the professional basketball players after they retire at a certain point end up losing their money. And, I mean, how right. many players, even in the NFL, we see that, or baseball or other sports. So we really have to spend some time with them and educating them in, in other areas of their life and helping them to look at their life as more than just, more than just the sport that they play. Well, and, and Carl, that takes me back to the question that we started to talk about before we went to break. And, you know, children, teenagers, sometimes even parents fall into the trap where a lot of these athletes are their heroes. And then you see the mismanagement of funds. You see uh, a darker side with the law, with drugs and whatnot. In a situation like this where there's bullying, okay, it's not a drug. They weren't, you know, DUI. They didn't go to jail. Um, you know, they weren't gambling. It's, it's, it's a bullying issue which is not just indicative to a youthful playground anymore. It's happening on an adult platform and so how should parents address this issue with their kids well i think it starts with conversation uh you know first of all you have to talk to your kids and find out what their viewpoint is about it and when it comes to bullying you have to recognize that a lot of times your kids won't give you the full story so you have to dig deeper and in the book itself the self-confidence factor actually have sample questions that a parent can ask their child to try to investigate if their child is a victim of bullying or if their child has observed bullying going on in, in their school or other environments. I also, uh, I'm a firm believer that we are the best example for our children as parents and that our attitude will be reflected in our children. So if my attitude is, well, he got what he deserved or he should be tougher or you know, if my attitude is, is negative in that way, then my child's going to adopt that attitude and that approach as well. And so it's really important for me as the parent to set the example for my child of what it is or how I want him to behave or the type of person I want him to be. I think the days of do as I say, you know, don't do as I do, or they're, they're done. You know, I mean, we're, we're living in a whole new world and a whole new lifetime. And and, and things are evolving and things are changing and we have to evolve and change and move forward. And that's, that's really just as a people in general, you know. So I really think it's important for parents, yes, I can idolize somebody on TV, but as, as a parent I have to educate my, my son or my daughter, whoever, and say, listen, you know, that person is still a person. They still put their pants on, you know, one leg at a time and they're going to do great with what they do, it doesn't mean that they're not going to have problems outside of that. And it's not about what their problems are, it's really about how they handle it, right? But I have right. an example from my child. Give us, give us, Carl, give us an example of one, of the, one or two questions that, you know, you talked about you can ask your kids. Give us an example from the book of what type of questions to ask. Okay, of course, by so, the book, but we want to just, you know, on the air right now, a teaser. Right, so... So in the book, we have some different uh, areas, because one of the areas that we talk about is, you know, with the school teachers, for example, uh -huh. you know, um, your child is going to feel close to, um, sometimes they're going to feel close to the school teacher, sometimes they may feel close to another friend, sometimes it's another uh, coach, right? But if you ask your child directly, like, for instance, um, have you ever noticed uh, somebody being aggressive? You know, like, have you noticed your friends playing aggressively? And then what did you do when that happened? That might be one way of bringing about the conversation. You know, so now, uh, what happens on the playground? Who's the favorite? Um, what is your favorite game? Or what do you guys do on the playground? That's another way to engage them in the conversation and get them talking about what's really going on. Is you kind of kind of approach it sort of like from a back door. Uh, sometimes if you directly ask, your child may not feel comfortable telling you because they don't know how you're going to respond. Um, and if you're the type of parent, again, that does fly off the handle and you do get upset that way, then your child's really going to be nervous about communicating with you. So it's really important that you're calm and 
just take in the information and then decide what you're going to do with that information later on. In other words, have a have a plan. Of, Absolutely, of, of, always have a plan. You know, People don't plan to fail; they fail to plan. Right. So it's like anything else, you know. So uh, you've got to have a plan. And now that because there, you know, fathers didn't know how to hug, and all those type of different things. And to, if I say we live in a different society, where you know those hugs are very valuable. And right. so we're going to take a break right now. This uh, we got Carl Maine on the line with us on Final Take. 15. We want to make sure that you stay with us because we've got a lot more, to, lot more to come right after this. 10. ESPN fifteen eighty. Mike, you live. ESPN fifteen eighty. Final Take. We're back with you here. Live from the Mile High Studios, uh, Carl Romaine is on the line with us. We've got uh, Lisa, Chris, and Fred. And if you want to uh, get more information about uh, Mr. Romaine, it's www.seafoodromaine.com. S-I-F-U, Romaine.com, which means master instructor. Uh, during the break, Fred had a very interesting question. You talked about, uh, I know that my little brother was a bully. Yeah, the brother right under me. People didn't mess with me because of him. Right. <laughs> so you had that question. What was the question? My, my question was to you, sir, is if uh, what questions can you ask your kids to find out if they're actually bullying other children? If they're the bully. Yeah. Well, you, one of the things that you can ask your 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 children is uh, is there anyone that's annoying or bothersome in the classroom? Who are the kids that you play with, and how do you play with them? And that usually kind of starts to give you a better picture of what's going on in the class and as far as how they're handling it and if they're the bully um, or, if, or if they're being bullied. Interesting, because I think uh, a lot of this bullying, so if somebody, you know, somebody bullied me, then I'm going to go bully somebody else, and it just runs downhill until mm-hmm. they have a problem. Well, I remember being a kid, and I, and I hope I didn't interrupt you, uh, Mr. Romaine. I remember being a kid. If you got punched or you got hit, other kids would tell you, go find another kid and punch him, <laughs> you know, and so that you'll let everybody know that you're not a chump, you know. Do and that's, others no, that and was, then split. That, then split. <laughs> Do, yeah, and that was, that was real advice when I was a kid. Don't let someone just... You, oh man, you got you got you got knocked out basically, mm-hmm. and I can't say the whole thing, but you got knocked out. Now you need to go find somebody and knock them out, just to let everybody know you're not a punk. Mm. Right. When we were so kids, it was good. very different, though. You know, times were different, right? And uh, we were taught yeah, to right. handle things right. a little differently, right? So, but now we're adults, and and the world has changed, and we can't. And and like you said before, you know, more violence is going to get more violence. And the truth is. You can't go around punching everybody out just because they don't like you or they called you a name, you know. Uh, so, so that's not really the best way to handle something. And the first approach is really to be confident and to speak up for yourself. And that's whether it's adult bullying or, or, or a child being, bullying, uh, being bullied. You know, when we talk about bullying and when I'm doing the bully seminars, the first thing that I try to do is really teach people how to approach any situation they're in with more confidence how to stand tall, how to look somebody in the eye, how to engage somebody in conversation, even how to approach somebody and shake hands. And I break all these things down into really simple uh, tools that they can use and put into effect instantly. And it's really amazing when you see a child, especially who doesn't have a lot of confidence or they're shy or awkward, and they start to develop that sense of self-confidence in themselves. And we've had situations with kids that, were being bullied, and just by simply teaching them how to present themselves in a more confident manner, the bullying stopped. You know, they carried themselves and it, differently, and, and they spoke up about, you know, I don't appreciate the behavior or what you're doing to me. And the bullying automatically stopped without without any violent attack. It's not like before you had to beat up the bully, and now you just right. have to pretty much stare the bully down in a confident manner. Maybe that's a little simplistic, but... Uh, you know, but that's basically what you're saying. You know, right. you, you also mentioned that the world is changing. Mm-hmm. And just recently we had Mike Sams who came out um, 
and and basically stated that he was a gay man, but he's going into a pro locker room. He's going. He's a. He's the first um, openly gay pro football prospect. Not that they didn't have gays in the NFL, because we all know that they had. But this guy had come out, come, you know, openly said that he's gay. What, what kind of? We, I just want to get your opinion on on that whole situation. Without well, I, I think he's a he's being confident, and at the end of the day, you know, he is who he is, and he's proud of who he is. He doesn't have to hide who he is. You know, I mean, you know, at the at what what are we really going to look at? We're going to look at how he plays the game. You know, his sexual orientation is really none of our business, to be honest. I mean, if he wants to put it out there, that's up to him. But at the end of the day, how he plays the game will determine how he will be remembered in history. And that's what we really have to look at. You but know, as I you mean, can see, once he made that that statement, this guy was at worst a second or third round draft pick. Now they're projecting him to be like a fifth, sixth, or seventh that the GMs are a little bit worried about having him in the locker room. Well, they're worried about the culture of their locker room, and that's one of the things that they have to do. They have to interview him to, to see where he's at mentally, emotionally, and that he's going to be able to handle whatever is going on in the locker room. They have to make sure the culture of their locker room is one where you won't have a repeat of an incognito Martin situation. You know, you have to really do the best you can to support him and make sure that he gets what he needs. You know, and like you said, you know, I mean, how many thousands of people have played in the NFL and maybe they were gay and didn't openly come out and say it? So it's, he's definitely not the first gay player in the NFL um, and probably won't be the last. Well, he's the first one that's actually admitted everything else has been in the closet. Say that again. Carl, go ahead, Fred, repeat your question. No, I, I just said that he's the first one to openly come out and admit it, but there have been there have been alternative lifestyle players mm-hmm. in the NFL, but they had to keep it on the wraps, on the QT, keep it in the closet, so to speak, mm-hmm. so they wouldn't be ridiculed in the locker room. Well, again, you know, I applaud his sense of self-confidence and self-esteem that he, he feels confident enough to go out there and say, listen, this is who I am. You know, whether you like me or not or whatever you think, it's, it's okay with me, but this is who I am, and, and I'm here to play football, and I'm going to do a great job. And I think at the end of the day, what are we going to measure him by, his sexual orientation or how he does on the field? Carl, are you confident that he would get drafted? I believe so. I, I, I don't think that they're not going to draft him. Uh, he may not go as high, and I think if he doesn't go as high, it'll be because they're concerned about the culture of their locker room and how the other players are going to uh, interact with him and accept him. And mm-hmm. I think that whatever team brings him on, the staff, the, the coaches, the management, the organization has to be prepared for you know, whatever, whatever they have to do to make sure that everybody works together and that the that he will get the support that he needs and that the other players, whether they're comfortable or not, uh, that there's an opportunity for all of them to have that discussion and put the cards on the table and know where they actually stand. You know, I, I don't think it's an issue they can skirt around, especially if you bring somebody on your team that, that other people may or may not be comfortable with, but I think that's with anybody. I think anybody you bring into your culture, you have to know that they're going to be okay and that you're doing the best you can for them and that if it's going to be something that's going to impact the team, even just from the amount of uh, media attention is going to be different and the questions that are asked are going to be different, then as a team you guys have to come together and say, okay, this is what we're going to do, this decision we're going to make, and then we've got to make sure that we provide the proper uh, training, the proper help for everybody around the situation so that we can just move forward and actually get back to the game of playing football. Well, and I think that Missouri is a perfect example of that because before any of this ever surfaced, think about from last August to the current day and time, how they protected him and and really kind of kept this out of the hands of the media, which clearly would have torn it apart and I think completely been a distraction for their football season. So I think that says a lot for the college, for the administration, for the athletic personnel. Mm -hmm. 
I, it would be nice if we could see that carry and on. And for the other athletes on the team. That, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. As an entire effort. Um, I think it's... I think it's remarkable, and these are young college men. These aren't grown NFL seasoned players. So I think that there's a lot. We always say, you know, what can our children learn from this? Well, I think it's also what can the seasoned NFL players learn from these college men who had a different sort of code, if you will, and protected protected their teammate because yeah. they knew mm-hmm. as soon as this news came out, bam, floodgates will open. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It is about your teammate, your team, and everybody being together. It doesn't mean that you may agree or that you're part of that lifestyle. That's his choice. But he's still my teammate, and I still have that obligation to treat him as a teammate and protect him and look out for him. And it's just going to help everybody on the team do better and and the team perform better. And as people, uh, those collegiate athletes at Missouri – they actually grew as people, if you ask me. They just didn't grow as football players. They grew as they they grew as young adults. They grew as they grew up as men. Uh, one of the Walter Payton was a great, 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 great football player, but he was a better man than he was a football player. And that's and then you mentioned that earlier. That's more important than than your uh, football legacy. Absolutely. You know, if you look at it, the average person who plays football, the average professional football player, their career is only three and a half to six years. Hello. There's so much more <laughs> life <laughs> that you have to live beyond the game when you really look at it from that perspective. It, it's not that long of a career. You know, and so Carl, we have all your information thing. here. We, we're going to go off. Uh, we're going to go into our second hour. Uh, but we have all your information on the other side, and we appreciate you coming on with us. We're going to give people all your information on how they can get your book and Amazon.com and the self-confident factor. We're going to give all that information out over the, on the other side. So you guys stay with us so they can get all the information. Carl, thank you so much for staying on, uh, staying on with us for basically 45 minutes, and this has been great. Forever.